Good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again for this uh, uh, Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía uh, web seminar in this, guy, in this case. And uh, today we will have the talk by uh, Abel Rosales Guzman from Mexico. This is the reason that uh, uh, the, the time of this talk. And he will talk about H key K band interferometric imaging of the Mira Star Air car. So uh, Abel Rosales Guzman, he got his uh, bachelor degree in physics at the Facultad de Ciencias at UNAM in Mexico in 2017. Then in 2019, he got the master degree in astrophysics at the Instituto de Astronomía, UNAM also, with the thesis Optimization de los Algoritmos de uh, HAWC para la búsqueda de GRBs asociados a ondas gravitacionales. Act, uh, actually, he is uh, he's in the second year of the PhD in astrophysics right? at the Instituto de Astronomía en UNAM under the supervision of Dr. Joel Sánchez Bermúdez. His uh, work centers in the study of stellar physics through infrared interferometric imaging. So thank you very much, Abel, for this uh, talk. And uh, maybe you want that I give you some uh, sign after uh, 10 minutes before the, the, the end or any work. OK. Uh, the floor is yours, anyway. OK, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my, um, today I'm going to talk about HK band interferometric imaging of the Myra star Arcar. And uh, this work is in collaboration, and these are the names of the collaboration team. In particular, Joel Sanchez is my, my supervisor. So first, I would like to talk about um, the scientific motivation of this work. Um, <clears throat> stars with masses up to eight solar masses evolve to AGBs and then to planetary nebulae. Um, AGBs return all their processed material to the interstellar medium, thus contributing to the enrichment of the galaxies. Uh, during this phase, mass loss guides the evolution of the star towards planetary nebulae. So it is known that the mass loss process is well constrained for carbon-rich AGB stars. Nevertheless, for oxygen-rich stars, uh, the mass loss processes are not well constrained yet. To constrain it, and uh, to constrain them, do we need to um, images of the most inner parts of the AGB, of the AGBs, um, in particular of the photosphere and the, the inner circumstellar envelope. And here interferometry plays an important role, allowing us to achieve angular resolution data to map this inner structure. Um, these are some examples of the use of interferometry in the study of circumstellar envelope and on, and on the surface. In particular, I would like to talk about uh, the, the article from Paladini et al. 2018 um, on Pi Gruis. One of the most recent and remarkable studies, including infrared interferometric imaging, is the one by Paladini et al. 2018. Claudia and her team used the Pioneer in the H band data at the maximum angular resolution to perform image reconstruction of the surface of the red supergiant star Pi Gruis revealing bright spots on the surface, which are these spots here. Um, also, they compared these spots with uh, models of star convection, stellar convection. Uh, this work highlighted the importance of interferometric imaging of evolved stars, but also the, the importance of convection in the mass loss and dust production processes. It is worth mentioning that the same study can be performed in MIRA stars to make a connection between the pulsating atmosphere and the dust production and stratification. And this is what we do in the, in the present work. But first of all, what is interferometry? Interferometry is a technique that has been used for more than 16 year, 60 years in the, at radio wavelengths. But in the infrared, it is a more recent technique of about 20 years. And interferometry allows, uh, allows us to observe objects with an angular resolution not achievable with single telescopes. The example here, a very 
well, it's, it's like a, a tune example, um, shows a, a telescope, a normal telescope, and the angular resolution achievable depends basically on the on its size and of course of the, the wavelength of observation. In interferometry, we use more than two telescopes and the angular resolution achieved depends on their separation, which is known as the baseline. And as you may think, two telescopes are not enough to map the, the structure of a source. Uh, we need many baselines and many orientations to, to map completely the object, the observed object. Uh, using interferometry, we do not see the object's brightness distribution directly. Instead, we observe uh, interference patterns uh, like this like this example here. Our observable here is the complex visibility function, which are, has two components. The magnet, also called fringe visibility or visibility, which gives us a measure of the contrast between the maximum and minimum in the interference pattern or in the interference fringes and provides information of, of the size of the observed source. And the phase, which tells us where are located these fringes with respect to a phase center. And this observable gives us information of asymmetries in, in the observed object. Also, it is worth noting that the phase is strongly affected by the atmospheric turbulence. And one method to minimize this effect is by constructing, constructing another observable which is called the closure phase. Closure phase is the result of the combination of three telescopes form, forming a closed triangular array as seen in the, as seen in the image. Here, um, the object's phase, the observed object's phase will be modified um, by the atmosphere, atmosphere located on top of each telescope in this way here. So if we, if we combine the phases of each telescope, we obtain a quantity that is mostly independent of the atmospheric turbulence. So the closure phase allows us to recover the missing phase that was initially corrupted by the atmosphere. And one of the most important interferometers to date is the Very Large Telescope Interferometer, or VLTI. The VLTI consists of four 8-meter telescopes known as UTs, which are the bigger ones in the image here. And also, there are four 1.8 meter telescopes known as auxiliary telescopes or ATs. The, um, the advantage of the, the ATs is that they can be relocated at different, spot, at different positions covering a wider range of baselines and orientations. The VLTI has many instruments which perform interferometry at, at different wavelengths, wavelength ranges. In this slide, I am showing you the two instruments used to perform our interferometric observations. On the right side, uh, this is an image of the gravity instrument, which work in the K-band from 1.99 to 2.45 microns, K-band. Uh -huh. And the maximum baseline achievable is 130 meters and works at three spectral resolutions. Uh, on the left side, there is, it's Pioneer, which works in the H-band from approximately 1.6 microns to 1.99. Again, the maximum baseline achievable is 130 meters. And uh, this instrument uses, uses the same telescope configuration as gravity with the difference of the spectral resolution. OK, now let's talk about our, the object of interest here. Our car is an AGB star. AGB stars are located in this region on, in the HR diagram. Um, AGB stars are also characterized by an inert carbon plus oxygen core surrounded by helium and hydrogen burning shells. Also, these stars present pulsations. And depending on the period of these pulsations, the stars are given different names. In particular, the ones with periods larger than 100 days are called Midas. Our car is a Mira star with a period of 309 days. It's located at 128 parsec from Earth. <clears throat> and its K-band magnitude, magnitude is minus 1.3. Given its distance and its brightness in the near infrared, our car is very important to study with, it, with interferometry because in, in principle, we can resolve the inner parts of the star. 
This is an image of the photosphere of Argar obtained in 2014 from Monier et al. I know that people from this institute, uh, the IA, worked in the reconstruction of this image. Um, you can see that there are two bright spots in the center of the star here, but also there are other structures in the surface and around it. This spot, these spots here could be associated with, with giant convection cells, but we will discuss this, this result a little bit, a little bit later. Um, first, I will talk about our gravity analysis. Um, our car was observed during 2018 using gravity in the months of January and February with a spectral resolution of 4,000. We applied a spectral revealing to preserve only eight spectral channels to work with. Um, the graphs here show our squared visibilities and closure phases plotted versus spatial frequency. In this case, uh, the, the, the minimum baseline is around nine meters and the maximum around 30 meters. Um, each color corresponds to an observation wavelength as marked by the legends here. And you can see that, the, that there are asymmetries in the closure phases. If the, for the, the closure phases are different from, from zero, which indicates that the object itself has asymmetries. Uh, in, on the right, we have the, the UV plane. And this is for the, the January epoch. For the February epoch, these are the, the observable. These are the observables. And as you can see, the observables here are different from one epoch with respect to, to the other. When changing from one slide to the other, you can see that there are differences both in the square visibilities and in the closure phases. The asymmetries here in particular are smaller in this uh, compared with the, the January epoch. So how did we analyze this data? Our first analysis step consisted on taking spectral channels one by one, for example, of, of the visibilities, for example, uh, the red square, and fit a geometrical model. The model used to fit our squared visibilities is shown in the right here. This model corresponds to a Gaussian function where rho is the spatial frequency and theta can be interpreted as the apparent size of the observed structure. Um, <clears throat> we choose this model because it is a basic representation of an envelope and it is useful for a first order size approximation. We perform the fit by using a nonlinear least squares method included in a Python package called LMFit. So um, the images here, uh, I put the, the images of the, the best fits. The dots represent our data and the lines, uh, our, best, our best fits. So as you can see, the trends in both epochs are different here and here, but also here the, the data does not mock. Uh, this affects the result of the fit as you, as you will see in the, in, the, in the lines corresponding to the best fits. But also when we plot the apparent sizes or the full width, full, full width at half maximum um, versus the wavelength, we can see many things. First, there is a dependency of the apparent sizes with respect to the wavelength. But also there is a difference um, in the apparent sizes, but with, of one epoch with respect to the other. Um, the maximum difference is around two million seconds at this point. And, at the, and we think that the, the reason that we are having different, different trends from one epoch with respect to the other or different sizes is because we are observing two phases of a pulsation cycle. And, but also, also the observer might be atmosphere of the star being more transparent at approximately 2.23 microns. Now, if we look at the light curve of the epochs corresponding to our data, we can see that between January and February of 2018, there is a change in the magnitude, in magnitude from 9.7 to 8.1. And you can, we can use this light curve 
to explain the change in apparent sizes between one epoch and the other. Now, um, this was the first step that allowed us to obtain a first order approximation of the size. It is worth noting that during this analysis, we did not use the closure phases. And one way to take into account the asymmetries present in the closure phases is via image reconstruction. So I will explain briefly this, this method. An image is, as you, as you know, is composed of pixels. And uh, in the field of interferometry, image reconstruction is, is known as an ill post problem. This means that we have more on parameters or date of pixels of the image than equations, the data we have. What do we have to know is that there is an equation which we have to minimize in order to, to obtain a, reconstruct, a, a well reconstructed image. This equation is this one, and which is often called a regularized minimization. The term on the left, uh, marked with the, with the red um, arrow, is known as the, the, the likelihood term. It, it measures the discrepancy between a model and the available data. The term R, uh, marked with the purple arrow, known as the regularization term, and it measures the discrepancy, but with the prior information. What do we know about the, the, the object that we are observing? And the hyperparameter mu, marked with the, the green arrow, basically sets the contribution of each term to the image reconstruction. Actually, there are a lot of image reconstruction softwares. We choose to use BSMEM, which, uh, which, is which does the minimization based in a gradient. Uh, it was developed by Jung Jung of the University of Cambridge. And BSMEM uses a prior image to perform the image reconstruction. So our prior, Im our prior images were generated using the previous apparent sizes and the function described previously, the Gaussian function. So we generated 128 by 128 pixel images with a scale of 0 0.46 uh, milliard seconds per pixel. And we then <clears throat> let the code run with a low number of iterations until converged. The code converged with less than 100 uh, iterations. And in this slide, I am showing you the corresponding reconstructed images of the, of the January epoch um, at each wavelength. Contours here correspond to 30, 30, 50, 70, 90, 95, 97, and 99% of the maximum. The white ellipse located in the right corner here um, corresponds to the mean synthesized primary beam. Given the size of this beam, we can say that the, indeed we are resolving the, the structures that we are observing. So um, all the images, all the images are um, have the same minimum and maximum, uh, as shown by this uh, color bar. Um, in order to make easy the comparison between epochs and between wavelengths. And now we, what we can see here is that there is a, a, a structure in the, not, um, like moved from the center of the image. Uh, it's like a spot, but also we can see that the images change, uh, it's change the size from one wavelength to the other. The, the size is decreasing until reaching to a minimum and then it appears that the images are increasing again. So we see that approximately 2.28, 2.22, 2.17 microns, the images are smaller, the, the, smaller, the smaller ones, which might be an indication of the atmosphere of the star. <clears throat> now, with respect to the February images, we see a more elongated structure, which is indeed, which also is more uh, centered. And that is why we observe um, smaller closure phases in this epoch with respect to the January epoch, because here the, the, the spot is moved from the center. And this, in, in this epoch is, is more centered. Okay. Um, the difference in intensity from one, from one epoch to the other is around 20%. But we also see that the, um, again, the images, the, the behavior of, of images with respect to the wavelength is, uh, is very similar, which means that 
the images are bigger here, but then they, they, it are, they are decreasing the size and then reaching to a minimum and then increasing again. So in other words, again, at 2.17, 2.22 microns, we might be observing the atmosphere of the star. Moreover, the, the outer parts of the image uh, here might, be cor might correspond to the inner circumstellar envelope, but we will discuss these results uh, later. Now, how do we, do we know the, the quality of our reconstructed images? So we, we used plots like these ones to, to compare our reconstructed images with our data. What we do is we extract the observables, visibilities, pressure faces from our images, and then plot them with the, with the, with our data, uh, with the, as function of the spatial frequency. Here are the closure faces, and here are the visibilities, closure faces, and visibilities. Um, these are two examples of the, the the agreement between reconstructed images and and data. So as you can see, we are recovering the general trend of the data in visibilities and also the, the asymmetries in the closure phases of our reconstructed images. These are examples of the agreement now be, be, between the, the data and the image. The, point, the black points correspond to, to the data and the red points correspond to, the, to, the, to our reconstructed images. <clears throat> and now, I mentioned before that our data was taken using a, a spectral resolution of 4,000. With this resolution, we were able to resolve the CO band heads located at 2.29 and 2.32 microns here. When plotting visi our visibilities and closure phases versus wavelength, we can see that there is a drop here in the visibilities and here. And those are the correspondent uh, positions of the, the two cell band heads. And in this case, each color corresponds to a different wavelength configuration. And the drops in visibility uh, indicate here that the structures of where cell is formed uh, or where cell is present are more extended than the continuum emission. So the, the, moreover, the, the values of the closure phases different from zero here and here are an indication that the cell is asymmetric and perhaps uh, clumpy. So to analyze the CO, we selected the spectral channels along the first and second band head. And we applied the same procedure as with the continuum data. So again, we fitted a, a Gaussian function and um, performed the image reconstruction. So first in this slide, I'm showing you the geometrical model fitting to the visibilities in the first CO band head. You can see that the, there are the trends between one epoch and the other are quite different. And this, uh, this behavior translates into a different estimation of the apparent size. And um, as you will, you will see in the next, uh, the next slide. This is, in, in this slide, the, the, there is the geometrical model fitting, but in the second bank. The, the, the points correspond to, to the data and the lines correspond to the, to the best fits. Again, the difference in the trends here and here um, is, correspond to different estimations of the size. So if we plot the apparent size as a function of the wavelength, we see that, uh, for example, the apparent sizes increase as we move toward lo toward, towards longer wavelengths. Uh, in particular, it is worth noting that the the apparent sizes in, the, in this second CO band head are more similar, with the exception of the first two channels. And also, well, um, we use these results to, to create our prior images, which are uh, the same, the same as, uh, size, 128 by 128 pixels with a scale of 0.46 milliard seconds per pixel. And we use the images to as priors in the image reconstruction. Now, in this slide, I show you the corresponding reconstructed images of the first cell band head in the January epoch. The first cell band head is uh, centered at 2.2946 uh, 
microns. Uh, the contours again correspond to 30, 50, 70, 90, 95, 97, and 99 percent of the maximum. Uh, all the images have the same scale of uh, of colors here, like the one here, in order to make uh, easy the comparison between epochs. So in this um, in this uh, epoch, the the images are more extended and with a structure that is different from the continuum. And we also see that these images are wavelength dependent. So given that we are mapping gas, which is constantly moving away, uh, moving, we can try to set a velocity movement with respect to the center of the line or <clears throat> Doppler shift. So positive velocities correspond to material moving uh, away from us and negative, ve negative velocities correspond to gas moving towards us. So as we can see the, the, the images corresponding to material moving <clears throat> far from us are very similar between each channel. And the images corresponding to gas moving towards us are very similar between each channel. Um, now, uh, in the case of the February epoch, the changes of the images as function of the wavelength are more evident. We see that the images corresponding to the blue shifted part of the part are different from the red shifted ones. And this might be an indication, we think that this may be an indication that the, the, the CO, the regions where CO are, is present are, uh, are, more, are clumpy, but we are uh, studying the result. So these are the images for the second CO band head, centered at 2.3240 uh, uh, microns in the January epoch. Uh, you can see here that the images across this band head uh, are uh, more asymmetric, more wavelength dependent. And in particular, the images near the center of the band head are very similar but are different from the images at the edges of the, of the band head. Here and here. Here, the same behavior is observed in this epoch. Uh, we are still working uh, to obtain a more quantitative description of all these images. Um, it is worth noting that these images are still contaminated by the continuum emission coming from the atmosphere. So to better understand this movement, this, uh, all this, this, uh, this behavior, we need to obtain differential images free from the continuum emission coming from the atmosphere. This is a work in progress. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about the image reconstruction performed with our pioneer data. <clears throat> our pioneer data were, uh, were taken during the last days of December 2019 and the first days of 2020 with a maximum baseline of 130 meters. Uh, you can see here the, the, the visibilities and closure phases and the, the UV plane. In this case, the, the, the asymmetries are, you can see more asymmetries here with respect to our gravity observables. Uh, given that we already have the size of the star, which is around 10 mass, 10 million seconds, there was no need to perform a parametric fit to the squared visibilities. In this case, we went directly to the image reconstruction and then we used uh, three different priors. The first one is the best image reconstructed in 2014. Um, sec the second one is a Gaussian, a Gaussian function and the third one is a Lorentzian function. So our first reconstruction is a gray image, which means that we are not selecting the spectral channels individually. Instead, we use all the spectral channels for the, for the image reconstruction. Um, the next step will be to perform a, a chromatic image reconstruction to see if there are changes in the structures observed on the surface and what is their relation with the wavelength. So we are working on, on that part. And again, the, all the image reconstruction were performed using uh, BSMM. 
Um, here I show you a comparison between the image obtained to, in 2014 from Monier et al. And this is our best reconstructed image with the pioneer data, with our pioneer data of 2019, 2020. And first, uh, we can see that there is a change in size between one, uh, one image and the other. Um, both images have the same scale. But not only there is a change in size, there is also a change in the structure, in the general structure and in the spots present on the or in the surface on the spots on the surface of the star sorry. Um, as you can see, the spots here are more elongated, but also are bigger than uh, are bigger and are located at different positions. Here and comparing with, with here. Um, we see that uh, our car is a very, a very active star, which is showing movement on the surface and also it's changing its size. Uh, so what happens if we compare this pair of images with our reconstructed gravity images? We see um, many things. Uh, when putting our, the pioneer image from first from 2014, we, we put, this image in the center of our gravity images, we see that the, the, the spots in the center of our gravity images uh, are bigger than the pioneer image from 2014. So one idea, one idea that came to our minds is that these spots might be uh, the, the giant convection cells observed with pioneer, but in this case, uh, uh, we are observing them at a lower resolution. Um, the contours of the pioneer image correspond again to 30, 50, 17, 19, 95, 97, and 99% of the, of the maximum. When comparing now, but with, we compare, when comparing now, but with our pioneer image, um, we see that the, the size of the, the atmosphere observed with, the, with, a, with pioneer is approximately equal as the spots in the center of our gravity images here and here. So this is a point uh, to support our theory, theory of the giant convection cells, but with lower resolution. Um, as I mentioned previously, we are also observing a more extended structure. So if the pioneer image fits in the, in the, in the, inner, in the center of our gravity images, then the, the, the extended structure must be the inner circumstellar envelope of our car. Um, until now, I, I talked about the, the reconstructed images, but uh, we still need to estimate the astrophysical parameters, both of the circumstellar envelope and of the, of the giant convection cells in the surface of, on the surface of the star. Uh, actually, we are working in to obtain the, the size and contrast of the convection cells uh, present on the surface of our car. And we want to compare, to compare them with models of stellar convection, just as uh, Claudia did on Pi Gruis. The image here on the plot here on the right shows a relationship between the size of the convection cells and the temperature of the star. Performing this analysis on, in, on, in our car will allow us to set a new point in this plot, which will help us to establish a more general relationship between the position in the HR diagram and uh, the size of the convection cells. Uh, in this plot, uh, this point corresponds to the, to the sun, to the, to the size of the, of the convection cells in the sun, and this, this point corresponds to the size of the convection cells in pi degrees and the, the, the effective temperature. We are also working in the estimation of the astrophysical parameters corresponding to the inner circumstellar envelope of the star. And for that purpose, we are developing a Markov chain Monte Carlo code using the, the model of a thin layer. This model supposes a central star with an effective temperature and a size surrounded by a layer uh, with no geometrical thickness, but with a with a, uh, with a temperature and size and an optical uh, thickness. Uh, the star uh, emits as a black body and then the layer absorbs the radiation and re-emits it like, it like a black body. 
And here I am showing you the, the and sketch of the model generated from the, the our, 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 our program. And now let me uh, make a summary and conclusions. So we studied H and K band interferometric data from 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, we found differences in apparent sizes from one epoch to the other, from January to February of about two million seconds in the continuum. And we found that across the two cell band heads, the sizes are more similar. Uh, our reconstructed images also present differences in the corresponding intensity of about 20%. And we also found wavelength dependencies on the reconstructed images, both in the continuum and across the CO band heads. And also reconstructed images of the CO band heads are more asymmetrical and more wavelength dependent, which might be an indication of a clumpy structure. Uh, also in the continuum, we identified the spotted, uh, spotted structures in the center that when comparing with the pioneering uh, reconstructed images, we found uh, comparable sizes this might be an indication that we are observing the giant convection cells, but in this case with a lower resolution, with gravity with a lower resolution. Um, regarding to pioneer data, we performed uh, the image reconstruction and we found significant differences both in sizes and in the structure between the image from 2014 and the image from 2000 and our image from 2019, 2020. And uh, this is an indication that uh, our car is, is, is uh, a very active star. And um, finally, we are working on the estimation of the physical parameters or physical properties of the giant convection cells and of the inner circumstellar envelope of, the, of this star. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Abel, uh, for this talk. And, uh, and now the, the talk is often open for questions. Please raise your hand for doing that in click on the reaction button in the lower menu and you will find a raise your hand there and I will let you open the microphone. Questions for Abel. I think there, there was a problem in the net in the institute because uh, a lot of people log out at the same time. Any question for Abel? I have one maybe. <coughs> uh, you're using this instrument. Can you use this for uh, uh, solar system objects? Because the resolution that you acquire it's very good for one or two objects that I'm thinking about and uh, can be used uh, in an object that is moving during the exposition time. For objects of the solar system, I think that the, the dust is, uh, is um, constantly or is, uh, in this case, the dust is, uh, we need to, to, in the infrared, uh, the dust is, uh, open, oh, how do I say it? The, I'm thinking in the in the technique of, of, of the observation uh, only. If we can uh, observe a solar system object with this technique that you're using, because I'm interested in the in the spatial resolution that you are, that you acquire. Yes, we can achieve a, a high angular resolution. I think that there might be we can we can there I, I don't see a reason to not observe to know not be able to to see solar system objects but i think that the objects the objects should be very bright because with interferometry we need to observe very bright objects because okay. for yeah, the more is, um, is the less bit. bright objects is difficult for the interferometer what do you mean with bright for example our car which has the magnitude of uh, which is very bright in the near infrared for example Thank you. 
Thank you. And, I yes. have, uh, Rene. Yes. Can I pose a question? Yes. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, sorry, because the, the, uh, my connection was interrupted for the last five minutes. Then I, I came back again to the, to the connection. Sorry for that. It looks like there are problems today in Spain with internet. And let me, I mean, I have two, two questions. The first one is when you compare the images of January and February, if you have a look at the, at the visibilities, if you don't mind, I mean, mm -hmm. there is one funny thing for me. Okay. Yeah, go, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, look, uh, go first to, to January and then February. Okay, look, what, what is funny for me is the following. If you look uh, to the January data, uh, first of the January, you can see that in the V square, these visibilities, uh, it, it looks like there is not a strong beating of the visibilities. It looks like it is dominated by the kind of a more extended structure. Although on the other hand, in the in the second law, there, there is a lot of a structure in the closure phase. However, if you go to Feb to February, and you look at the same spatial frequencies, you can see that there is a strong beating in the square visibilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you compare those, in, in then in principle, when I saw that, I thought that, okay, what it should be happening before seeing your images is that in February, there should be a compact, a, a very compact structure that is producing this bidding in the, in the global square visibilities. Uh, but it's not the case because what I have seen is that there is more, it is more extended. And in fact, you can see here that the, it's a strange because you, you see strong bidding, but on the other hand, the, the closure faces are, are smaller. Okay, then, then there is, a, um, in, in fact, a, a, at the beginning, I thought it, it was in contradiction a little bit with the results you get. But I asked, uh, which is the, have you investigated which is the, the origin for the strong bidding that you see in the V-square visibilities in the February uh, epoch? Um, no, what we did was to, uh, for example, um, we see differences in the, the, the visibilities, for example. Uh, yeah. First, we were we were trying to, to combine uh, the two epochs, um, but we after after we analyzed or we checked the, the, the same baselines and the same orientations, mm -hmm. and we found that at the same uh, spatial frequencies for the for the same baselines and the same orientations, we have different uh, different. Uh, Trends or different different values uh, from the spa uh, the spatial frequency. Let me let me go to to the, to the back of the slide. Um, this when we compare similar baselines and similar orientations, we found differences in the closure phases in particular uh -huh. here and here. And, what we did, what we think here is that we are we were mapping two different uh, two different structures or two different uh, pulsation phases, and we decided to separate. But the the, the other the the other method we don't we don't uh, we don't try it or we don't. Uh, okay, we I will uh, investigate uh, this the, the behavior that you described, and I will uh, come with the. Uh, the answer. Okay, there will be an answer. I mean, it's, it's a security from the point of view of interferometry. And my second question refers to the to the convection shells mm -hmm. that, that you found in the in the image. Hmm? In fact, uh, with the clear change in the in the structure between 2014 and 2020, which are the typical lifetime of these convection shells? Actually, I don't know. Uh, I haven't investigated that yet, uh, but uh, mm, no, I, I don't I don't know what is the the, the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But probably, I mean, those that you are seeing in on to, in, in 2014 and those that you are seeing in 2020 probably are not the same. Yes, probably are not the same. We. What we think is that maybe these ones moved to these ones, but uh, we're not sure about that yet. Okay. 
very good and, and and there are no observations in in shorter time scales yes to to define which is the because it will give important information on the structure of the the star of course yes we we those are all the data we have uh -huh. yes okay many thanks thank you thank you anton <laughs> <laughs> Any other question for uh, Abel? <clears throat> Seeing none, I need uh, to thank again Abel for this very nice talk, and uh, mm -hmm. and and see you in the in the next meeting. Anton? Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Adele. I think we we are finishing now the.